The morning scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on the foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have, only, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. The disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men besides women and children. No doubt one of the most favorite New Testament stories told to children and remembered by those same children is this story that we find in Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 through 21. And that is the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. That's the story that we're going to take a look at this morning. And that is what we are going to try to explore, not in the simplicity of just a children's story, but we're going to try to jump into this text and learn the lesson behind it. What does it mean to us today? It's not just a story about an amazing miracle. It's a lesson for us that we can learn and we can gain through its study. But in order to learn that lesson, the very first thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to understand the man behind the lesson. To understand Jesus Christ and what he was going through at this period of time and the lesson he was trying to present not only to the disciples present on that day, but for us as well. So let's begin this morning by taking a look at the story's background. This is found specifically in verse 13 of our text. And we're going to learn from this text that Jesus knew sorrow. He understood pain. He understood what it meant to be hurt. He understood shedding a tear. And we learn this from various passages of Scripture, but beginning there in verse 13, we read, When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. What did he hear about John? What was so important about what he learned? Well, if you'll remember from our study last week in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, we talked about how John, and this is in reference to John the baptizer, how John was put to death by Herod because he said what needed to be said. And we read that in Matthew 14 and verse 3 and verse 4, that Herod had him arrested. He had him bound and put into prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have him or for you to have her. And so in that passage of Scripture, we go on to read that Herod has him put to death because what he said was not popular. It was certainly not popular with Herodias. And this particular woman scorned through her daughter demanded the head of John the baptizer on a platter. And that's exactly what was delivered to him. At the very end of this text, in verse 12, we read that his, talking about John's, disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they went and reported to Jesus. So now we understand what it means when Jesus heard about John. He heard about his death, and there he withdrew to a secluded place. Why would he do that? Why would this information be so 
trying, so traumatic to our Lord? Well, I want to give you several reasons for that this morning. First of all, in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, we learn that G John would be that forerunner of Jesus. It was the angel who said to his father, Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Verse 17 reads, It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was that great forerunner who would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. That in and of itself made him a very great man. But we read in Matthew 3 verses 1 through 6 that he was also a great preacher. Before we hear of Jesus preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we read about John preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was a bold preacher. And he was that fellow that didn't dress too well, but he was out in the wilderness. And he was preaching such a profound message that we read in verse 5 of Matthew 3 that Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Every preacher dreams of that day when the whole town shows up to hear him speak the whole county, the whole surrounding area. John actually was that preacher. His words were so inspired, his message so profound, that everybody, even the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, showed up to hear him speak. And they were moved by his words, and they were responding to the invitation. John was indeed a great preacher. And we also read in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, that it is John the baptizer who baptized Jesus himself. Now, not for the reasons we are baptized today. We are baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. We are baptized to wash away our sins, uh, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. We are baptized to put to death that old man of sin and rise to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. But John baptized Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. And he was even reluctant at first to even do it because he realized how great Jesus was and how lowly he was in comparison to the Lord. But John the baptizer indeed baptized our Lord beginning his ministry and ushering forth his teachings on this earth. In fact... John was so great that in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, according to Jesus, thus far up to that point, Jesus described John as the greatest person that had ever lived. He said in Matthew 11 and verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Now he goes on to talk about with the coming of the kingdom, those who are a part of the kingdom and those who can be a members of the body of Christ will be able to achieve heights even greater than John. But up to that point, of all those born of women, there were none greater than John the baptizer. All of these are reasons why Jesus, when he heard this message, might have withdrew himself from the crowds to a secluded place. But I want to suggest to you that there is also a lesson that we can learn as to why Jesus knew sorrow in this matter that is found for us in Luke chapter 1 and verse 36. And that is when we read this passage of Scripture, Behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. That was a message that was delivered to Jesus' mother Mary about her relative Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the baptizer. What does that mean? 
Yes, John was great in so many ways. But John was also family. John was family. He was a close relative to Jesus Christ Himself. And we can understand now why he may have in fact understood sorrow because of the death of this, his closest of kin. Have you lost someone that's close to you? Have you lost a family member that's special to you? Just a few weeks ago, Sherry and Mary and I got to visit my folks in their new home in the Dallas, Texas area. And we spent just a few days with them, but it was good time spent with them. And I am of the age myself to where I'm realizing that my 80-year-old mother and my 82-year-old father are approaching that end of their life. Unless Christ comes again, that's a guarantee, that's a promise that's delivered to all of us. That unless He comes again, we will face a point where we will die. It's been appointed for all men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So I realize that that time is coming, and I realize that my time with them is becoming precious and perhaps fewer as the days move forward. Just a few nights ago, uh, my wife and Mary and I were watching a television show, and something happened on that television show that reminded my wife of her mother. My wife's mother passed away of a rare form of Lou Gehrig's disease in 1997. And as I looked over to her during the middle of this television show, I noticed that my wife was just crying, tears rolling down both cheeks. And I kind of knew what it meant because I figured out what was going on on TV and I figured out the connection with her. And I said, are you thinking of your mom? And she nodded yes. And I said, 20 years later, it's not any easier, is it? She goes, no. Losing family can be one of the toughest things that we can endure. And although Jesus was and is God, when He came to the earth, He put on flesh. He was a human being just like one of us. He thought like we did. He felt like we did. And on occasions, He cried like we did. One of the most quoted verses of the Bible probably because it's the shortest verse in the Bible, is John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. But one of the reasons that we see that this is so significant is because we understand that God in the flesh had human emotion, had feelings, just like we do. Jesus knew sorrow. So we understand why Jesus often wanted to get off by Himself because there were matters of the mind, matters of the heart, that he wanted to get away from the crowds and just have some time by himself. And he often spent that time in prayer. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, we read, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. In Luke chapter 22, verses 40 through 42, Soon before Jesus would be arrested and hung on that cross, we read that when he arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he, talking about Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray. And this is what he prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus was going through difficult times, when Jesus was going through the struggles that we face in this life, He knew where to turn. He knew in the midst of His sorrow, He could obtain comfort. And I believe that in that short little verse of Scripture, in verse 13 of Matthew 14, when we see that Jesus learns about John, His relative, I have a feeling that when He pulled away from everyone and everything, He did so so that He could mourn. But he also did so so that he could receive comfort from his heavenly Father. In addition to the story's background, we really need to kind of understand the story's basis or the story's reason for existing. And we find that really in verses 14 through 18. 
where we learn that Jesus understood responsibility. I want you to take a look at that text with me. Matthew 14 verses 14 through 18. I want you to consider something that is very revealing to us about Jesus and about his view of others in verse 14. We read that when he went ashore he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. I want you to consider that for just a moment. Jesus felt compassion for them. You can feel compassion for a lot of people, but what does that mean? In Jesus' case, it meant action. It required action. Jesus did not feel for someone and not act upon it. When Jesus felt something like compassion, he often and usually did something about it. Whether that was a word of instruction or whether that was the power of his healing, he did something about it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41 reads, Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. In Luke chapter 7, verses 12 through 15, we read about a woman who had evidently just lost her son. He had passed from this earth. And we read that as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. The many problems that are faced by man, not just issues of disease, but issues of mentality, emotion, and spirituality are areas where Jesus would come upon person after person and have compassion upon them and want to do for them whatever He could to make them better, to make them whole. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of weakness, of sickness. And seeing the people, He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. I want you to consider the little transition Jesus makes there. Jesus is the one who is saying, I have compassion and I do something about it. Now all of a sudden he uses this illustration as a lesson for his disciples. Because they too were going to need to learn His compassion. And they too were going to have to step into His shoes when He would leave soon thereafter and place the responsibility of the church and the evangelization of the world on their shoulders. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10? You probably do, but let me have you turn there. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. Because Jesus tells this story. In Luke 10, beginning in verse 30, Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now here is Jesus, a Jew, speaking to Jews about a man who has been robbed and left half dead and two Jewish leaders, a priest and a Levite, the religious leaders of the day, come upon the scene and they can help the man. They certainly could have stopped and attended to his needs, but they didn't. They saw what was going on and they ignored the problem passing by on the other side. But then Jesus talks about a Samaritan. 
half Jew, half Gentile, someone looked down upon by the children of Abraham, someone considered to be less than a dog because of their mixed descendancy. And Jesus says, But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. Now look at this next verse. Look at all the things that he starts doing. He came to him. He bandaged up his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. In other words, treating him with the medicine of the day. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn to take care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. I love the question that Jesus asks next. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Jesus was teaching that compassion alone is insufficient. It requires action. And what he says to him is you can talk about mercy all day long, but you have to have mercy. You can talk about supplying the needs of those in the world or even the needs of the saint, but unless you actually do it, they're empty words. And so too were the words of Jesus. Not that they were empty, but they were filled with great substance. Because Jesus, not only in His words, but with His actions, demonstrated what real compassion truly is. It's love put into action. So when we go back to our text in Matthew 14, we read that Jesus felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And in verse 15, when it was evening, the disciples came to Him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to Him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Maybe they were missing the message. Maybe they were like us. I've heard some people talk about this passage of Scripture and they kind of get on to the disciples. But to get on to the disciples really means we need to get on to ourselves because how many of us would think any differently? Let me give you an example. Last night... One of the members of this congregation celebrated his 87th birthday, and 70 or 80 of us gathered next door and celebrated with him. And that gentleman's son drove down from West Virginia with all kinds of supplies ready to surprise his father, and I think succeeded in doing so. And that gentleman, with a little bit of help, fixed the entire meal for everyone who was present. And those of us who were present know that that was an amazing meal. This was not Taco Bell send-out. He didn't order pizza and have it delivered. He had shish kebabs. He had potatoes, corn, green beans, all kinds of salad and desserts. It was quite an amazing meal. And after it was over, there was so much food left over, he said, please, here's some to-go containers. Take them home with you. I even got one of those to-go containers, filled it full of food, went back, sat down, and ate it, and went back and got another to-go container filled so I could take that home, as I had been asked. It was a lot of food. They started in the wee hours of the morning, cooked all morning, all afternoon, and all the way right up until we were served, and they sat there and served us, and one of the young men about 9 o'clock sat down and finally was able to feed himself. That was 70 or 80 people. We have an idea from what we read in verse 21 that there were not just 5,000 people, that there were 5,000 men there, but women and children. And if you just consider that there's at least one woman for every man, if you consider there's at least two children in, in, in each of these families perhaps, you may be looking at conservatively 20,000 people. The disciples say they need to go take care of themselves because in their minds it's beyond their comprehension that they would be able to take care of them, much less be responsible for doing that. 
And after all, we're going to read, they only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Let's set the, uh, the fish aside for a second, lest we get into a lesson on sushi. Let's talk about five loaves of bread. We kind of know what a loaf of bread looks like. Could you take five loaves of bread and take a knife and divide it into 20,000 pieces? Could you? I mean, I'm sure that somebody says, well, yeah, I could probably do that. But really, think about it. How many pieces of bread could you get out of one slice, much less one loaf, much less five? That's all they had and two fish. Are the disciples thinking any differently than any one of us here today? There's too many people, and we're not responsible. They need to take care of themselves. We don't have enough food. There's no way we can share it with them. We couldn't divide it logically into enough pieces to even give anybody a taste. How many of them are any different from us? But we are called upon to have compassion. We are called upon to do that, which Paul said in Colossians 3 and verse 12, those of you who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. But passion within reason. You, you see these headings that I have up here where it says Jesus understood responsibility? You know what I wanted to say? I just couldn't figure out a way to make all three points work this way, so I accepted Jesus understood responsibility. But what I wanted to say was Jesus thought outside the box. And you know what? That's a real problem for some people. That's a real problem for people. Have you ever heard that uh, saying, some people can find the solution to every problem? I recently heard this, some people find the problem with every solution. And that's true. Some people think that way. Everything's working great and they still have a problem. But sometimes when people face a problem, they see only the problem. They don't see the opportunity. They don't see the solution because they can't seem to think outside the box. <laughs> Several years ago when we still lived in Missouri, I was downtown at our restaurant and I was sitting over the side doing some paperwork and our assistant manager at the time was at the counter. Now we have a lunch buffet every day between 11 o'clock and 1.30. And 2 o'clock rolled around. And although the salad bar was still up, all of the pizza and hot food had been taken off of the buffet. And a family of five walks into the restaurant and walks up to the counter and they see the salad bar still up, but they can probably see right next to them that there are no pizzas out. And they ask the young lady, is your buffet still open? And she looks at them and she says, no. And she kept looking at them. Faced with no other alternative, as far as they could consider, they said, okay. And walked out the door. And all that money that could have come into my pocket walked out with them. And I looked at my assistant manager and I said, no. And I went after the people, out the doors, into the street. And I said, hey guys, the buffet is not up, but we can fix you anything we want. you want. We can make it just like a buffet for you. You just come in and tell us what you want. That's what we'll fix for you. And they said, well, that sounds like a good idea. They came back in, sat down, enjoyed the food, and I got paid. I said to my assistant manager later, I said, never confront a problem that you don't try to find the solution. And sometimes you got to think outside the box. If the buffet is closed, what else can we do to make a customer happy? And when somebody is in need, although we may see that there are limitations, we may think that the need is too great, we may feel that we have too few assets available to help, think outside the box. Think like Jesus and realize that with him, extraordinary things can be done. That brings us to the story's lesson that's found for us in verses 19, 20, and 21. And that lesson is not in the past tense. That lesson is in the present tense. Not only for the story in the past, but for us today. And that is Jesus is powerful. And we've got to recognize that. 
I think that the disciples were looking at this situation without the power of God. They've already witnessed Jesus do so much. So much of a miraculous nature. They have seen His power. They have seen His deity. They have seen the miraculous wonders and signs and miracles wrought because of the power of the Spirit that was within Him. Do we see that today? In this passage of Scripture, verses 19 through 21, this is what we read. In verse 19, ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish. Now that's the first thing that I want you to look at. He took what was available. He took what was in the disciples' hands. He took it and he put them in his hands. And he saw what he had to work with. And he began from there. There's a great story in the Old Testament, story of Moses. And you remember Moses, when he was around 80 years old, was out in exile in the wilderness. And a message is delivered to him. Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to confront Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, let my people go. Now Moses, who had been raised in the household of Pharaoh, understood the power of the Pharaoh understood his authority, understood his ability to literally require a person's life at any time that he had the whim to do so. He understood that what he was doing was going into a very dangerous place to say, I want you to let all of Egypt's workforce go. So Moses started coming up with excuse after excuse after excuse. And on one occasion in Exodus 4 and verse 1, Moses said, What if they do, will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, and listen to this question, What is that in your hand? What's that that you're holding? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched it out by his hand and caught it, and it became the staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Do you remember that story a little while later? When Moses actually confronts Pharaoh, he's got his own magicians. And when Moses throws his staff on the ground, it turns into snakes. So the magicians, somehow they throw their staffs down on the ground and they become snakes. You remember what happens next? Moses' staff ate their staffs. That's the power of God. And I think this is a good lesson. Because when we doubt, maybe we need to remember that question. What is in your hand? What has God given you? Because Jesus understood what was in his power and in his hands, and he understood that it could be used to the glory of God in ways that his disciples couldn't even fathom. In the very next part of verse 20 of Matthew 7, uh, of Matthew 14, or, I'm sorry, in, in verse uh, 19, not only did he take the loaves and the two fish, but then he looks up to heaven and he blesses the food. This is mindful, remindful of me uh, of James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. One of the things that Jesus did for us when he humbled himself and took on the form of flesh, took on the form of a servant, was that he demonstrated for us how we are to live. And in this particular instance, he did not move forward but he remembered the Father, and he remembered where all blessings come, and he blessed the food. And then what happens next is amazing. Breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. We're not talking about 12 apostles. We're not talking about other believers who were following. We're talking about every man, woman, and child present. As we said before, maybe a conservative estimate, maybe 20,000 people, Everyone ate and was satisfied. I know what it means to eat. And I know what it means to be satisfied. Last night's meal, we were satisfied. We had more than enough, and it was wonderful. Good tasting, very filling. Can you imagine taking five loaves, 
two fish and feeding tens upon thousands of people to the point that they're all stuffed. And then what happens next just blows my mind completely. They pick up the leftovers. Now this congregation knows I'm a man of leftovers. I'll eat my leftovers and I'll eat your leftovers. Several of the young men the other day were eating lunch and there was Bill Benton sitting beside me and when he had finished, I started eating his french fries too. I'm a man of leftovers, have no problem with that. People send me their leftovers home. But if I start out with five loaves and two fish, how many leftovers am I going to have? Twelve baskets full? Some of you have heard me say over the years, if I could go back in time and could witness any of the miracles of the Bible, what would they be? And so many people themselves, they'll say the parting of the Red Sea or maybe the creation week or, or Jesus walking on the water. And these are marvelous stories indeed, but I just want to see this one. I want to see how anybody takes five loaves, two fishes, feeds thousands, and then has leftovers. I want to know how that was. I want to see that. Because indeed, that's beyond my thinking. It's beyond what I can fathom. But that is the power of God. That is the power of Jesus on that day. That's the power of Jesus in our lives today. The problem is we have to have the kind of faith that Jesus had in His heavenly Father. He had an absolute faith. We often have little or no faith. But do you realize the Bible teaches even with little faith we can accomplish a great deal? In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, He said to His disciples, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. You see, we've got to recognize what my wife recognizes in her favorite verse of Scripture in all of the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. You see, I think the disciples were timid in a way. Not timid being afraid that they, could, that they couldn't feed these people. They had made up their minds there was no way possible that they could feed these people. They were timid or shying away, maybe not even accepting mentally the power of the Christ. But we don't have that power of timidity. God hasn't given us, as children of God, timidity. He has given us power beyond what we can comprehend. He has given us love beyond what we can comprehend and discipline beyond what we can comprehend. We're to be like Christ and have an absolute faith that can produce for others absolutely. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I want you to consider what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 13 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 13 through 21. Paul writes the following. He says, Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations or on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Can we take a passage of Scripture like this and learn to retrain our brains? Can we learn to think differently? Can we accept that the power of God is beyond anything that we can comprehend and yet Paul is saying, but try to anyways. 
Because that power of God is the power that is at work in our lives and can work in our lives beyond all that we can fathom if we will let him. You see, there are some people who stifle the power of God. There are some people who quench the power of Christ because they don't believe that any good thing can come about. They don't believe that blessings can flow. They don't believe that God can do amazing things even today. They look back at the Bible and they think five loaves, two fish, the feeding of the five plus thousand, great story. But that doesn't happen today. Brethren, let's have at least the faith of a mustard seed. And if at all possible, Let's try to have the faith of Jesus himself, an absolute faith that knows no limits and no bounds to God's ability to work in this world and to work through us. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 reads, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? I hope if we've understood the story of Jesus feeding the multitude, I hope that we can understand that indeed God can supply all of our needs. He can give us everything that we need in this life so that we can live eternally with Him in heaven. What kind of faith do we have? God understands sorrow. God understands responsibility. And God understands power, especially through the working of God the Son. Can we understand those same things this morning? If you're not a child of God, the invitation of the Lord is open to you. It's open to you all of the time, 24 hours of the day. But we certainly want to make sure that you realize that it is open for you right now. If you have not put your faith into practice, repented of sins, confessed the name of Jesus and been baptized into Christ, here's that opportunity for you to do that right here, right now, to be clothed in Christ and have those sins washed away. If you are a child of God, what did you learn from the lesson this morning? Did you learn at least a little bit that God can do more than you can comprehend and God can do more in you than you might just think? I hope that's the case. But if you have doubts this morning and we can help you with that, we stand ready and willing to pray with you and for you. If you've got troubles in your life that we can uh, help you with, that we can give you a shoulder to lean upon, to cry upon, because sometimes the struggles that we go through in this life are difficult. It's one of the great gifts of the body of Christ. We have brothers and sisters who care about us and love us and want to empower us with the power that God's given them. If we can help you this morning, let us know how we can. While together we stand and sing.